Hello, and welcome to another episode of Trust and Trade, a podcast produced by the Antitrust Law Section of the American Bar Association. Trust and Trade is a podcast for seasoned practitioners interested in deep dives into the areas of competition, consumer protection, and privacy law, and casual listeners who want to better understand what these laws do and don't allow. Each episode is presented by one of the specialty committees within the section. This episode is produced and co-hosted by the Federal Civil Enforcement Committee of the Antitrust Law Section. Today, we're going to take a look back at the first two years of antitrust enforcement in the Biden administration. Even before the November 2020 presidential election took place, the left wing of the Democrats was pushing for a historically aggressive approach to antitrust enforcement. The Biden administration made good on its commitments, appointing progressive favorites Tim Wu, Lena Khan, and Jonathan Cantor to key positions within the National Economic Council, the Federal Trade Commission, and the Department of Justice's Antitrust Division. Of all the ways you might describe the Biden administration's approach to antitrust enforcement, lack of boldness would not be one. Some of the notable steps taken in just the first two years of this administration include issuing the executive order on promoting competition in the American economy that launched a whole-of-government approach to competition, a new emphasis on the labor market, including a proposal to ban non-compete agreements, criminal charges for the first time in 40 years in a Section 2 monopolization case, major cases against the GAFA global tech giants, the Federal Trade Commission's suspension of early terminations and merger reviews, rescission of the vertical merger guidelines, and willingness to re-examine even previously cleared transactions, a rethink by both agencies of the horizontal merger guidelines, and a skepticism towards traditionally held merger efficiency arguments and the advancement of theories around potential competition and killer acquisitions. If you start from the position that the system had been working well until now, as many in the defense bar do, you might characterize these individuals as radicals, their actions as destabilizing, and their choice of cases as tilting at windmills likely to result in bad precedents. If, however, you start from the position that the system has not been working well, as many progressives do, you might see things quite differently. You see an economy where, over the past few decades, more industries have become more concentrated, with an increasingly fewer number of competitors capturing increasingly larger market shares. You see flawed economic arguments about self-correcting markets and type 1 versus type 2 errors and the like, enabling bigness and making a vice not a virtue out of keeping multiple smaller players in the market. You see harsher penalties against fixing the prices of computer screens than in suppressing people's actual wages. Seen through that lens, there may be a coherence to the Biden administration's approach to enforcement one in which short-term losses can lead to long-term benefits, uncertainty in the merger approval process is itself a check on monopolization, and a belief that foundational economic assumptions have been proven wrong and should therefore no longer be doctrinal in order to create a more fair and level competitive landscape. To help us unpack the track record of the first half of the Biden administration is my co-host, Michael Murray. Michael is a partner at the Paul Hastings Law Firm and a former Principal Deputy Assistant Attorney General of the DOJ Antitrust Division. Michael, who are our guests today? Thanks, Anand, and it's great to be here. I'm excited to uh, host this pod, help moderate this podcast with two great panelists. T. St. Matthew Daniel is a partner in the litigation department and member of the antitrust group at Paul Weiss. She joined the firm after spending several years in the antitrust division in various roles, including as a line prosecutor, counsel to the AAG on criminal matters, acting director of the Procurement Collusion Strike Force, or PCSF, and as an assistant chief in a criminal section. We also have Lauren Willard, who's a partner in Covington's antitrust and appellate practices. Lauren rejoined Covington after spending four years at the U.S. Department of Justice, where she served as a counsel to the Assistant Attorney General of the Antitrust Division, as counsel to the Attorney General, advising on antitrust and technology, and as a member of the Antitrust Division's trial team in the U.S. v. Google search monopolization case. With that, let's jump right in. We're going to do a whirlwind tour of mergers, cartel, conduct, and special topics uh, such as labor. There's a lot to talk about and a lot of key takeaways. Our basic lens will be as a not foreshadowed. Should we view these developments as successes or failures and from what perspective? So let's talk first about mergers, including enforcement challenges. It's widely perceived that the administration is bringing more merger challenges. Here's my question, and let's start with Lauren. Are there more merger challenges today? Will that continue? And what is the administration's perspective on bringing more challenges and losing some of them? 
Well, first of all, thank you all for having me here today. Um, it's an exciting conversation. And I'll give the usual, usual caveat that the views expressed are my own and don't necessarily reflect those of Covington or its clients. But with that, I'll turn back to merger enforcement. So yes, Mike, I think we have seen an increase in mer- merger enforcement challenges in the Biden administration over the past two years. And in part, this appears to reflect the administration's general view that past merger review has failed and resulted in greater con- consolidation, higher prices, less innovation. So the current antitrust agencies believe they really need to be more vil- vigilant in reviewing mergers. And we've also seen a willingness of both the DOJ and FTC to push the boundaries on theories of harm in merger cases, including an increased interest in vertical theories, as well as a focus on nascent and potential competition. Now, this new aggressive legal stance is also combined with the FTC and DOJ's reluctance to accept proposed remedies by the parties. And I think the result is we're seeing more and more mergers that are challenged in litigation rather than being settled through a consent decree. Um, And this merger enforcement strategy by the Biden administration has had mixed success, however. Um, As we've seen, the DOJ has lost several merger cases in court in its first two years, including the United Healthcare Group Change merger challenge, the Sugar merger case, the Booz Allen Everwatch merger, as well as the FTC's recent loss in the Meta Within challenge. But at the same time, the DOJ did win its challenge to the Bertelsmann Penguin acquisition. Um, and even in within the even in the Meta Within challenge, um, we saw the court ruled against Meta on the facts, um, but it did accept the concept of a potential competition theory. So in terms of going forward, I don't think the administration will be deterred from bringing more merger challenges simply because of these losses. I think we've seen a a willingness for the agencies to litigate and lose because they see part of their role to push the boundaries and take on that risk. Thanks, Lauren. T, uh, from your perspective, and, and, and this goes to what Lauren just said at the end, do you think it's a hit or a miss that the government is bringing more merger challenges, uh, but not winning all of them? Thanks, Mike. I'm really excited to be on the podcast today with you and Lauren and Anant. Um, let me just adopt Lauren's disclaimer, speaking for myself, not my firm or any of our clients. And as a fairly recent former DOJ attorney, I should just also emphasize that my remarks are drawing from public information. Um, But with that out of the way, um, you'd asked if it was a hit or a miss. And I think it's just a little too soon to tell. Um, You know, there's been a lot of litigation um, and, you know, takeaways that Lauren just summarized. The thing to remember is that the administration came in with, you know, just this really ambitious agenda. And right from the start, they emphasized to the line prosecutors that, you know, they were going to be okay with losing some cases. And that if the agencies were always winning, um, maybe that was an opportunity to do some soul searching and figure out if they were bringing enough tough cases. And so there's there's a sense, at least with the current leadership, that, you know, losing some cases is worth it. And it's to focus more on the lasting impact of these cases. And what I mean when I say the lasting impact is, you know, there's a thought about whether, you know, some of these cases could help deter or discourage some transactions that the agencies view um, as so blatantly anti-competitive that they should never have left the boardroom, right? Um, There's this idea that, you know, you can't challenge all deals. There simply aren't enough resources for that. But maybe by being incredibly aggressive, Um, and bringing so many cases to court, you can deter some of these deals. So only time will tell if that's true. Um, I think the agencies are also really focused on litigating uh, cases that can assist with developing pro-enforcement case law and and rebuilding the agency's bench of trial-ready litigators. I think when the government fails to block a transaction in litigation, they still come out of it with a lot of lessons learned and with several more attorneys, economists, and other professionals that have now lived through the somewhat unique grind of a merger trial. And so sometimes even in a loss, they've secured what they view as as good experience for the staff, lessons learned for the future, and if they're really lucky, uh, potentially sort of useful case law for the next case. And Lauren flagged one of those, which was, you know, I think the government has a sense that there was some good silver linings out of matter within. Um, but there's always a risk. And I think United Health Change is an example of a case where, you know, they're going to be grappling with some of the impact, lasting impact from that opinion for a while in terms of litigating the fix, in terms of the court's views on a private equity buyer. Um, 
it's just, you know, it's too soon to sell. I think the jury is definitely still out on this one. Thanks, T. And, and that's those are some really interesting points regarding deterrence uh, on lasting impact of particular enforcement decisions. And that makes me think of another area where there's been um, quite a bit of developments recently, and that's labor. Uh, there's been there have been criminal developments, civil conduct suits, merger challenges re- related to labor, and all of these things are are, are relatively uh, novel. It seems. Uh, let's start with with Lauren first here. What do you think the future holds for antitrust enforcement uh, in the labor markets? Sure, Mike. So I think promoting competition in labor markets has been a high priority across the Biden administration. We saw that reflected in Biden's July 2021 executive order on competition. And we've seen both the FTC and DOJ make labor a top priority, and there's been a number of developments in this area. I think for today, I touch on two particularly notable developments. Um, The first would be the DOJ's prosecution of no poach and wage fixing agreements criminally. And second would be the FTC's recent proposed rule to ban non-compete clauses and employment agreements. So starting with the no poach cases, um, so the DOJ has started to investigate and indict horizontal agreements among competitors to fix wages of their employees or refrain from hiring each other's employees as criminal violations of the NHS laws. And the DOJ has argued that these types of agreements are akin to the price fixing or market allocation agreements concerning products that DOJ has historically treated as per se criminal violations. Um, I'd note, however, this development did not originate with the Biden administration. We saw back in 2016 that the FTC and DOJ issued joint guidelines that previewed that DOJ would start treating such naked wage fixing and no hire agreements criminally going forward. And DOJ actually brought its first criminal indictment for a wage fixing agreement back in December 2020. But we've certainly seen an increase of these criminal investigations and cases during the Biden administration. And like the merger challenges, there's been a mixed record of success, I would say. So the DOJ lost two of its criminal labor antitrust cases at trial kind of based on the facts, although courts recognized, you know, the motion to dismiss stages that there could be criminal liability for wage fixing and no higher agreements with the right facts. Um, and DOJ is continuing to bring criminal labor antitrust indictment. So I think we'll have to see what happens in future cases on whether this enforcement strategy is successful. Um, but it's certainly getting attention and certainly putting employers on notice that some criminal liability is possible in this area. Um, and then turning next to the FTC's proposed non-compete rule, on January 5th, by a vote of three to one, the FTC issued a proposed rule that would ban most non-compete clauses and employee contracts. So in particular, it would make it illegal for an employer to enter or attempt to enter a non-compete with a worker or maintain a non-compete or represent to a worker that it's subject to a non-compete clause. Now, this rule is currently open for public comment, um, and that period has been extended until April 19th, 2023, um, extension from the earlier March 20th deadline. So after that point, the FTC will consider the comments and determine whether the rule should be changed and then issue a final rule. And then at that point, companies will have 180 days to come into compliance. Um the rule's quite expansive, I would note. It would preempt a number of state laws on non-complete clauses that have a different analysis and threshold for when such clauses are impermissible. And as noted in Commissioner Wilson's dissent, there are a variety of ways this pro- proposed rule could be challenged in court um, if and when it becomes final. Um, in particular, I think there's a good question of whether the FTC has clear statutory authority to engage in substantive competition rulemaking under the major's question doctrine following the Supreme Court's recent decision in West Virginia, the EPA. Um, I think it's too early to tell what will happen with the FTC's non-compete rule and whether a judicial challenge, which almost seems inevitable, will be successful. Um, I think there's two things that could happen. On one hand, if finalized and upheld in court, the rule could give the FTC significantly more authority in this area of the law. But on the other hand, the FTC's action here could backfire if challenged in court and the judiciary uses it as an opportunity to curb the FTC's authority more broadly. Um, And then there's also a question of whether a failed attempt by the FTC will have a future impact on on legislative efforts related to non-competes, which may well have been part of the administrative strategy as as this um, for this topic. So 
I think it's it's definitely an a, a aggressive a bit and a broad action in this area, but we'll have to see how it shakes out in terms of the final rule and the potential challenge in the courts. T, uh, there's a lot that's happening in, in labor, as, as, as Lauren just mentioned. Uh, what do you see as the trajectory going forward? What's the next step? Uh, and how do the relate the the developments at DOJ in terms of criminal no poach enforcement relate to the uh, FTC's uh, non-compete rulemaking. Thanks, Mike. Um, I think that labor, the the labor enforcement focus is this is just every indication is that this is just going to continue and and it has been a priority now for a couple of administrations and it's going to continue to be that for the foreseeable future. One of the things that I think labor, the labor enforcement program has allowed uh, this administration to do is, is really operationalize two ideas they came in with, right? One idea was we're going to use all the tools in the enforcement toolkit. And the other idea was this whole of government approach that is captured in the executive order. And, and when you think about it, you hear some of these slogans sometimes, and it just sounds like, you know, it's what, it's what politicians do, right? They get these catchy slogans. But what all the tools in the enforcement toolkit means, and at least in the labor context, is that the agencies have used it, for example, to say, okay, the FTC has rulemaking authority, they believe, let's try it out. Let's find a place where it could be meaningful and it could have impact um, and see if it'll survive a legal challenge. And so the FTC itself estimates that the proposed non-compete rule as drafted could invalidate as many as 13 million non-competes and increase wages by almost $300 billion nationwide. So it's pretty significant impact. And Lauren's right that it's almost certainly going to get challenged legally. And I think what happens next is an expectation that the FTC will sort of keep up the pace with this, with the, with the hope that the current administration will have a final rule and will be in a position to defend it at, against at least the first wave of legal challenges, right? Because that's almost certainly going to happen. So that's that's sort of the all the tools in the enforcement toolkit. It's sort of captured in, in the rulemaking. The whole of government approach that you know it couldn't have come at a better time for the antitrust division. It already had the procurement collusion strike force, the PCSF. It was building all these relationships, revitalizing some of the existing relationships with other agencies, and the executive order just supercharged that on the criminal side, and then allowed the antitrust division and the FTC to sort of re-engage with their sister federal agencies at a time, I guess, where the national tension has been captured by all things related to antitrust and competition law. And, and it's not just a slogan anymore because now you can see, you know, the department, the antitrust division brought the Packers and Stockyards case. Um, and when you think back to the initial HR guidance issued back, way back in 2016, I don't know that anybody sort of had Packers and Stockyards case at a sort of it on their bingo card. And so you can kind of see the behind the scenes work, uh, sort of building test cases um, through the prior administration and building relationships. And you can kind of start seeing some of those results. I think the Department of Defense is really another partner in this whole of government approach. If a typical antitrust division case with DOD would have had DCIS or NCIS investigating bid rigging of public procurement, um, and now you see D DCIS working labor cases, and so they're really taking that really holistic view of, of competition. So I think, yeah, labor is giving them the opportunity to, to do things that they take as top priorities and, and turn it from not just a slogan to actually something that's meaningful. Thanks, T. Uh, that's uh, very interesting. We've been talking for a little bit about developments on the, the government side of the house, and the other side of the house is uh, the effect that those uh, policies um, and enforcement actions can be having uh, in the private sector. And I'm curious, uh, from both of your perspectives, we'll start with Lauren, uh, are these policies uh, and enforcement actions having the desired effect in the private sector in your experience? And also, how does uh, Commissioner Wilson's uh, resignation factor into, uh, into that effect? 
Well, I do think that it's certainly making companies more aware of their labor practices and, and using this as an opportunity to take stock. And, and we'll get to some of this later as well. But at the same time, these haven't really been tested in the courts, um, especially for the non-compete rule. So it's unclear whether they'll have their desired effect. As I mentioned, it kind of could go one of two ways. And so at this point, uh, I think companies, there's no need to make drastic changes because it's unclear whether or not this rule will go into effect and be a withheld in court. Um, And then in terms of the criminal NHS laws, as I mentioned, I think certainly whenever you tell a company something could be criminal, uh, it gets their attention. But at the same time, it for the for the wide variety of 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 actions that involve the labor markets on vertical restraints and, and kind of non horizontal wage fixing, it's unclear how much this this more targeted approach will affect the general labor markets, but it's certainly getting companies attention, I would say that. Um, and then with Commissioner Wilson, we saw her resignation relatively recently. And as she was a vocal dissent, as we saw on the FTC non-compete rule. Um, and so it will be interesting to see kind of what happens down the road without having her voice there, um, as well as who might replace her going forward. T, what, what do you think? Do these Are these policies and enforcement actions having the uh, desired effect? You know, that question made me wonder, what is the desired effect, right? And it came back to where Anand started the conversation. I, I think Lauren's right that, you know, a lot of this is sort of, well, wait and see mode and trying to figure out, well, do you need as a company or as a business that so there's things you need to do now to try to prepare for what people are predicting might be coming next. But then at the same time, it's just, well, if it's not the law yet, then then maybe there isn't a whole lot you can do, for example, with the proposed rule. I do think that if if you start out from a premise that there's been sort of under deterrence or under enforcement, that one of the the sort of if effects that has occurred is just this general sense of uncertainty. There's a greater degree of uncertainty, not just related to labor um, issues, but I think just more broadly in the antitrust space. And and I think you know that uncertainty has in, has has prompted some companies, and I would go so far as to say many companies, frankly, to be sort of just more aware and engage more frequently with in-house counsel and for in-house counsel to engage more more frequently with outside antitrust counsel. Because I do think that most companies and most people want to comply with the law. Most people don't want to assume um, additional antitrust risk or, or any legal problems um, without you know wanting to do the right thing, wanting to comply. So I definitely think that the greater sense of uncertainty um, which may have been one of the goals or at least a desirable side effect from the agency's perspective, um, you, you sort of feel that a little bit when you engage with business people. Thanks, T. Let's shift gears a little bit. Uh, Assistant Attorney General Cantor spoke last year and uh, a couple of times about algorithmic conduct, which is relevant in, in lots of different uh, industry verticals, lots of different spaces. Uh, and let's let's start with T. Uh, do you anticipate any development on that front with respect to algorithmic conduct? And does that relate at all to the recent withdrawal of the healthcare guidance documents? So it, it's interesting because we've been hearing a lot about AI, right? Not just in antitrust, but like everywhere. It's AI, AI. And and the AG, uh, AG Cantor has been talking quite a bit now about AI. And he had this one line uh, recently about uh, whether it's a smoke-filled room in a basement or you're using AI or an API, it's still the same thing. It's still collusion. And then, you know, in early 2023, uh, his principal deputy, Doha Meki, she specifically spoke about algorithms um, in the context of a policy announcement withdrawing the healthcare guidance documents that had previously provided these safety zones for certain types of information sharing. She repeatedly emphasized in her remarks how markets were evolving and changing, and and it was time to sort of keep up with technology. And and then she specifically expressed concerns about AI and algorithmic uh, pricing. So I think that it is clear that the agencies are concerned about it. Um, The question then becomes, well, what what more specifically are they concerned about? And I think, you know, that's going to take some cases. It's going to take some enforcement actions. Um, I will flag that, you know, in 2015, um, the Obama administration actually criminally charged an individual and his company 
alleging that the defendant and a competitor had agreed to adopt specific pricing algorithms with the idea, the goal of coordinating changes to their respective prices. So it's not that the division hasn't sort of had this in focus and hasn't, you know, brought even brought a case uh, sort of premised on algorithmic collusion. It's just that there's just been so much comment recently, and then particularly in the context of the withdrawal of the healthcare guidance documents, that it does make you wonder. And then, of course, more recently, there have been these press reports about, you know, uh, the uh, rent setting software facilitating collusion between landlords, allegedly. And so this is definitely, I think, a, a space to watch. Lauren, do you think that the uh, withdrawal of these guidance documents is a, a hit or a miss for the uh, the current leadership? Well, I think this goes back a bit to T's point about uncertainty and whether we view that as a good thing for deterrence or whether we view that as problematic for companies. Um, Because I would say that the withdrawal of the guidance documents injects a fair amount of uncertainty for companies that have relied for some time on the safety, safety zone when thinking about how to permissibly engage in benchmarking and information sharing. And to take those away without any replacement may make it difficult for companies who are trying to navigate this area in good faith. Um, so whether you view that as, as good deterrence or whether you make it more difficult for companies to engage in, in pro-competitive behavior kind of depends on, on which side you're looking at this going back to a non opening. Um, and I think the other issue, too, with the withdrawal of the guidelines is that you have to recognize that many of the factors in that safety zone were or are already part of the legal precedent for determining whether kind of such information sharing is an antitrust violation. So the question of how old the data is, how many participants involved, the use of an independent third party will still be relevant in any court challenge. And so it's hard to tell now whether withdrawal will actually move the needle on the case law until we see more cases involving this area, which I expect we might see by the administration given kind of the withdrawal and the focus. And as T mentioned, some of this is animated by kind of new technologies and algorithms, um, but it, it, it's hard because it is so much uncertainty um, for companies that are trying to navigate this space. Can I jump in here real quick and just flag that the DOJ has withdrawn this, these guidance documents. The FTC is not, right? And so to Lauren's point about the uncertainty, you do have one agency saying this doesn't reflect our current enforcement intentions, and the other agency has been quiet. And and that is is, is also very creating a, a real environment or, or atmosphere of uncertainty. So my hot take is that folks should just start evaluating their antitrust risk for existing information sharing involving competitors, you know, all those related to competitive sensibly competitively sensitive information, you know, including the obvious prices, wages, benefits. But then just sort of double checking that their compliance programs, everything from like your do and don'ts and your checklist and cheat sheets sort of relied on by business people actually accounts for the new reality that the department doesn't, this doesn't reflect their current enforcement intentions. To Lauren's point, the case law is different and then the FTC hasn't said anything yet, but um, you know, the, the guidance you're giving people day to day sort of has to reflect that there is some uncertainty and it's not as black and white anymore. That's really interesting, especially with respect to the divergence between the two agencies, which we saw some parallel with with merger guidelines earlier um, uh, in the administration. Uh, Section one guidance is uh, is a good bridge in some ways to talking about criminal antitrust policy more generally. Uh, In the last administration, there were some revisions to the leniency program with respect to cooperation. Now there's the Monaco memo. Uh, And and let's go to, to T, how should we view these changes Uh, And how will they affect the leniency program? So I think, so just taking a step back, the leniency program, the changes to the leniency program were announced sort of before the department put out the Monaco memo. But I think what folks need to know is that the the division was very much involved in in sort of the department sort of review of the uh, sort of corporate and uh, uh, criminal sort of enforcement policies. and, and, And they made that quite clear. Um, that they were part of those DOJ-wide discussions. And so even though the timing sort of seems like, well, one, the division came out before the Monaco memo, I think when you read them closely, you see, sort of see a lot of the same themes. Um, the basic idea being, you know, it's all about individual accountability and, and, and that companies should, should be coming in early and, and sort of engaging with prosecutors 
and 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 sort of showing that their good corporate citizenship is real and meaningful. Um, so that's I think that's the basic idea sort of behind both sort of revisions or updates across the department. Uh, that said, I think you know for the antitrust division, the leniency policy is, is sort of a unique tool, um, and it's always sort of depended on on whether the incentive structure like is hitting just the right balance. And so now with these revisions, that a lot of it has sort of put a put more of the onus on companies, or sort of made it quite clear the onus is on them to earn leniency. And, and it's clear that the antitrust division wants to be certain that it's going to get the benefit of the leniency bargain it's made. It's going to get witnesses that are prepared to testify in a trial because more antitrust division criminal cases are going to jury trials. And, and fundamentally, it's, you know, it's going to take time to figure out whether the division has struck the right balance in terms of incentives. Are they getting better quality witnesses? Are they getting better quality cooperation? Are companies still seeing the value in leniency Or is there just too much risk, too much uncertainty built into the program? And is there too much uncertainty, honestly, when it moves from just being a strictly strictly a criminal investigation with DOJ into sort of the follow on civil litigation? And so there's so many more questions than there are answers at this point. But but I do think that the division is is sort of in line with where the rest of the department is going on on sort of corporate uh, accountability and, and corporate criminal enforcement. Last topic uh, for me for today before we, we circle back and, and wrap up, and this one's regarding remedies, uh, and we'll start with, with Lauren here. There, there's talk that DOJ and FTC on the merger side are less accepting of merger remedies. Do you think that's true, uh, and, and what effect, if any, does that have uh, on the, the behavior of uh, potentially merging parties? Sure. So I agree that DOJ and FTC have generally been less accepting of remedies in the Biden administration. I'd note that the resistance to remedies is not entirely new because there was a shift from accepting behavioral remedies, even in the last administration, given the view that non-structural remedies were difficult to monitor and and enforce. But the current view goes even further that the DOJ and FTC seem to be less willing to accept remedies at all, even structural ones. Um, And as I mentioned earlier, I think this posture results in more challenges going to litigation than we might otherwise see resolved through consent decrees. Um, And sometimes the agency's unwillingness to accept remedies has hurt their case in court. I think T alluded to this earlier, because in the United Healthcare um, merger challenge, the parties had agreed to a divestiture that they claimed would resolve the horizontal concerns. The DOJ refused to accept the remedy. And when it went to court, the court found that it needed to analyze the merger against the proposed divestiture and found that the divestiture did, in fact, resolve the horizontal competition concerns. So I think there's a lesson here for companies to consider what remedies and divestitures might help resolve competitive concerns and to propose them to the agencies even if they're unwilling to accept it, as litigating the fix could put the parties in a better position in court than they might otherwise be in. Thanks, Lauren. T, one of the things I like to do is try to draw connections between different aspects of antitrust law, which is essentially three practices in one. Do you think there's an analog to this uh, question and issue regarding remedies on the merger side that is also uh, applicable or true on the criminal side? I think perhaps um, it depends. One of those lawyer-like answers. No, I I do think that you know if you talk to sort of members of the cartel bar, they will immediately think to themselves, well, of course, it's it's the division's reluctance to sort of engage in pre-indictment meetings or pitch meetings. It is it's the division's sort of reluctance to engage in reverse proffers, where you know they had traditionally expected prosecutors to sort of preview sort of their legal theory and the factual basis and, and, and sort of give their clients sort of the opportunity to, to particularly their corporate clients, the opportunity to, to sort of reflect and then decide if they wanted to get on a plea path. So if you talk to some of the, the, the members of the cartel defense bar, they would definitely immediately hone in on the idea that the division doesn't do reverse proffers anymore like they used to. The division doesn't do pitch meetings or pre-indictment meetings anymore. And, and they, some of them would argue that it, it has affected the quality of some of the cases or suggest that it leaves the division sort of not as sort of sensitive or aware of potential 
uh, weak spots in, in its case. And then at trial, that's when it fully comes to that understanding because it didn't have that pre-indictment engagement with defense counsel. I, I think that, you know, a lot of the, the division isn't doing pre-indictment meetings or pitch meetings. Some of that has been overblown. Um, but for the nerds that read the justice manual, I will flag that that sort of that sense that there were no pitch meetings and no engagement with defense counsel sort of hit a fever pitch um, around the summer of 2022 when the division edited the justice manual to say there will only be pitch meetings if in staff's view you have engaged productively um, through with them throughout the investigation. Well, in November, the division went very quietly and edited that justice manual provision. And now that says that a pitch meeting will generally be afforded unless uh, defense counsel essentially hasn't engaged productively. So if that gives people some 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 sense that, you know, it's not it's not an unwillingness by staff to hear their pitch. It's just perhaps, you know, a desire to incentivize them to do it earlier in the process or be more be more engaged. That is a great nugget, T. Thank you for pointing that out to our listeners. This administration has certainly been ambitious in um, the ways that it's been pushing enforcement. When you, I think you said um, that who had Packers and Stockyards on their bingo card, I wrote down who had Robinson Patman on their bingo card. And, you know, that's something that people are having to dust off and, and take a second look at with this administration as well. But I was also drawn to what you and Lauren pointed out that Although it's easy to talk about what each administration does in isolation, oftentimes what uh, the, the work you see in one particular administration is kind of the fruition of seeds that were laid a couple of administrations ago. Um, the, uh, the the quote about some uh, transactions should never have left the boardroom. I think that was from Bill Baer, who was saying you know, two AAGs ago. So, with that said, um, whether it's uh, things that this administration can do in the next two years or kind of some groundwork they can lay for future administrations. Any predictions? We have at least two, possibly more years left in this administration. Any, any thoughts on what we might see in the next couple of years? So I, I think I would just say I don't see the DOJ or FTC slowing down in terms of pursuing their enforcement agenda. I think, as I mentioned earlier, they're not scared to litigate and lose if they think they're pushing the boundary and bringing more cases that they should be. So I would just anticipate additional merger and conduct challenges, as well as pushing the envelope on some of these policy uh, efforts as well. Um, where exactly they're going to go is hard to predict. Um, but I think, as T mentioned, it's helpful to look at speeches and kind of nuggets from whether the justice manual or, 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 or the speeches or statements they're making. But I would continue to see full steam ahead for the next two years in this administration in terms of making antitrust enforcement a top priority across the administration. I agree with Lauren. Um, I also just have to give a shout out to the career staff at both agencies, because to Anand's point about how it doesn't all happen overnight, I think a lot of the enforcement work and and some of that continuity is 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 the career staff, right? It's the folks that work and build those cases. Some of those cases take years, um, and and so got to give a shout out to our people at the DOJ and the FTC. And I, um, I, ha I have to echo that for T. Yes, the career yeah. staff are, have been amazing, and I think yeah. you've seen the the recent uh, legislation efforts have also started to increase more funding for kind of the DOJ and FTC. And we'll see if that gives them more resources. But the career staffs have been kind of amazing pushing these forward. And you're right, they don't happen overnight. So as a lot of these cases started in prior administrations are continuing to push forward. Yeah. So I think my my prediction is that we're probably going to see some more health care enforcement from the antitrust division. Um, the division signed an MOU with HHS. Um, it was fairly low key, but the terms of that MOU basically allow the division and HHS now to pursue uh, criminal charges against companies in healthcare without, uh, with with a plan, with a plan to address uh, mandatory exclusion, which was basically the one of the key factors in a lot of the DPAs the division did. Uh, a couple years ago involving uh, companies involved in healthcare uh, in the generics investigations and in the oncology investigation. And the division said as much at the time that, you know, there was this concern about mandatory exclusion and, and the possibility that criminal 
plea, uh, a guilty plea to a federal felony could lead to mandatory exclusion. Now the division has this MOU with HHS. They've got a path out of that and a way to ensure those healthcare assets remain in the market and competition is preserved and enhanced. So I would imagine that the division is interested in seeing how to actually implement this now and get some actual guilty pleas in the healthcare space. We've covered an amazing breadth of topics in this short podcast. Uh, Mike, T, Lauren, what are the three key takeaways for practitioners? Sure, I'll I'll kick us off. I think um, for mergers, I think companies contemplating a merger acquisition in the current environment should think about litigation strategy early on, as well as give critical thought to the antitrust deal terms, such as the breakup fee, hell or high water provisions, and drop dead date, knowing that many deals, especially those involving bigger companies, are likely to receive more scrutiny during an investigation and maybe challenged in court. So this isn't to say deals will not get through, including through victories in court, but it does raise some additional cost benefit calculations and strategy considerations for companies. And I think a second takeaway, and then I'll kick it over to T, would just be the labor context, because as we've mentioned, this is, you know, a top priority for both the DOJ and FTC. So I think employers need to be aware of potential antitrust issues in the labor market. So this may not require drastic changes to current practices, but it would be wise to assess what labor restrictions an employer has, are they necessary, are they reasonable, and to be particularly careful with, with respect to any horizontal uh, labor agreements that the DOJ could try to prosecute criminally. And with that, T, I think you have our third takeaway. Thanks, Lauren. I've got our third and our fourth takeaway. So our third takeaway it sort of picks up where you left off with the idea that the whole of government approach means that folks in regulated industries, government contractors, um, they need to be thinking about how to educate their regulators on on the competitive effect of of conduct they're engaged in or transactions they're contemplating because it's clear at this point that the agencies are educating those agencies and those agencies are starting to think, well, what should I be doing in terms of of, of a competition as I carry out my regulatory mandate? So I think that's that's my first takeaway. Um, And then my second is related to AI. Um, A much smarter former colleague of mine pointed out that it took about six months um, between uh, AG Cantor starting to talk about criminal monopolization of Section 2 and the division actually filing its first case. And now the division's filed a couple cases. So I think if ever there was a time between the headlines, just generally about AI, and then between the antitrust division specific headlines about AI, if ever there was a time to get your AI house in order, understand how you're using artificial intelligence in your business and where it could have competitive impact, um, I think now is the time to do that. It makes you wonder if there's an issue about to drop in terms of an enforcement action with an AI element. Um, time will tell. We'll see. Mike, T, Lauren, thank you for what's been an excellent discussion about enforcement at the federal level. To our listeners, be sure to subscribe on your podcast platform of choice, and we'll see you next time on Trust and Trade.